Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session one of Art Forum 2021. If you haven't met me, I'm David Sequera, and I'm the director of the Margaret Lawrence Gallery, and I'm also the person that has the profound privilege of programming Art Forum. And before I introduce our guest speaker, Judy Watson, today, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Greater Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather. And um, just to take a moment to consider that for generations before the VCA was thought of or the University of Melbourne was thought of, that song, dance, paintings, sculptures, stories were made and shared uh, on this land and that these rituals continue today. And it really is with great joy that I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. This session of Art Forum is pre presented in conjunction with the Melbourne Reconciliation Network. Our guest speaker, Judy Watson, is a one-year artist who works in printmaking, painting, video and installation. Her work often examines Indigenous Australian histories. Judy's studio processes involving tracing, outlining and wet pigments are intimately connected with her interests in the indelible stains left on country through the reverberations of colonization. Through the layering of surfaces, Judy's ethereal imagery suggests notions of concealed pasts, memory and illumination. Her work is held in major Australian and international public collections. And most recently, her work was shown at Tarawara in the exhibition Looking Glass, Judy Watson and Yuani Scarce, and at Art Space in the exhibition Jilong, Du Malara. Judy's work will be featured in the forthcoming exhibitions, The National, and The Image Is Not Nothing at the Margaret Lawrence Gallery. Wherever you are, please make our guest speaker, Judy Watson, very, very welcome. Uh, so, hello everyone. I'm a one-year woman uh, currently speaking from Yuggera Turrbal country in Brisbane and great to be here and great to see you again, David, and uh, any other colleagues and friends out there where you are. Uh, yeah, let's start. And I should just explain that one-year country, you'll see it from the first slide, is actually uh, up in northwest Queensland and it is cut by the Northern Territory border. So our country is between both uh, Queensland and the Northern Territory. And uh, what I'm gonna show you an image of here, Bujamala Wanami. Wanami is the word for water in Wanyi language. And Bujamala is the name for uh, the ancestral rainbow serpent uh, creator of the waterways, etc., in our area. So here you can see uh, the tip of a canoe. And this is a video work in which I sat on the canoe <laughs> and uh, held my iPhone and just filmed. And you hear the bird sounds. If anybody who saw the Tarawara um, exhibition would have seen this possibly. And you hear the sounds of country. And then you see the canoe tipping from side to side as my sister Lisa Watson uh, was paddling. So this is a really beautiful area. The water is um, fed by um, subterranean um, uh, uh, basin uh, coming from the Barclay Tablelands. But while there seems to be a lot of water there um, around this country, it's very, very dry. And this water is contested as water and other natural resources are everywhere in Australia. And in fact, in one of the springs, uh, Lilydale Springs, which I've been to, uh, sorry, Louis Creek Springs, been to a few times over the years. Um, they are being depleted and no longer running. Century Zinc Mine is close by. And as with all across Australia, we have issues with fracking, mining, uh, deforestation, many other things which are contributing to environmental degradation. So we all have to take care and work together to ensure that our environment is sustainable. The same as our ancestors did before us. Um, both my one year ancestors and um, uh, Aboriginal ancestors all across the country. So we need to realize we're all on this country together now. It's a shared space and we need to look after it. Next slide, please, David. These uh, next works here are Avones in your collection, 
our hair in your collections and our skin in your collections. And they relate to a trip that I did um, to various museums in the UK uh, back in 1995 uh, when I had the Martin Chandon residency in France. And I came across, I basically at that stage I was sending faxes trying to find out where um, Aboriginal cultural material was from our country and where it was housed. And you can imagine, fax goes, pings out and then comes back. Yes, we have this. I mean, I sort of had done my research beforehand. Yes, you can come on this day. And I went and did some drawings. And so some of the material you'll see include with this one, our skin in your collections. It's a pick of, um, a pitchery bag beneath it, which is almost like a sort of a rainbow form. The previous one, there was um, an armband uh, and various, um, an apron on the left side under our bones. There's a forehead band up the top. And many of these things are using hair and fibre, which would be rolled along the body to make string. And when that happens, um, it's picking up, first of all, it's the DNA from somebody's hair. Then there's the DNA involved with rolling the fibres along the leg, perhaps, uh, picking up sweat and hair and skin. And then the people who are wearing the subsequent, you know, sort of our woven garment would also be um, having this beautiful hair string belts, caressing them. And then that DNA is all attached within that fibre and object. So I'm really interested in the fact that our ancestral uh, cultural material, it's like the old people are hiding within them. When they are taken to overseas spaces, like overseas museums or out of country, uh, the old people are still there. And that's what uh, a lot of my work is about, you know, thinking about who, how did this object get taken? Uh, why was it taken? Uh, you know, and in some cases it was taken after massacres. Was it bartered, traded, stolen? How did it um, subvert from being worn on the body of Aboriginal people in this area to suddenly, you know, going by ship um, in the old days and other means, you know, sort of in more contemporary times and suddenly be in other collections? For, for instance, Spencer and Gillen, who have collected um, material for many places, they have... Um, sometimes uh, taken five of the hair string skirts and they'll appear in different collections. So I think, how did they do that? Was that, that a job lot? Yeah, I really don't understand. Okay, next one, please. Deadly Bloom. And uh, uh, this was part of a whole body of work that I made around the time for the Venice Biennale. And I'd been to Venice and I sort of knew about uh, the waterways there. And I was thinking about the canals being like carriers, um, almost like within the body, you know, sort of um, how our blood and our, you know, other um, material sort of gets carried around the body. And I was thinking that in terms of Venice. And at the time in Sydney, there were these, um, what were called red tides, where there's too much nitrogen, not enough oxygen, and you get this algae, these red algae choking the waterways. So the deadly bloom is one of these. And of course that hasn't just stopped then. Uh, we get the blue-green algae and the, um, the red tides in many um, times to, due to, you know, whether it's depletion of our waterways or um, other, you know, chemicals choking. Okay, next one, please. Waterline. Uh, this one I'm thinking about the shape of what Lawn Hill Gorge would be like. <laughs> and that's Bujamala Lawn Hill Gorge, where my uh, matrilineal family spent time, uh, if you were able to see to the bottom of the water. Uh, the image on the left is a spine form, and I reference that back to uh, my grandmother, Grace Isaacson, talking about when she was a little girl, maybe five or six years old, being taken with her mother, Mabel Daly, and other family, running away from Riversley Station. Uh, she said they just, you know, took off in the middle of the night. They were escaping violence. The police used to come in and take the, the kids away as well. And in fact, they were hidden on a number of occasions because they were alerted by the station manager's wife, um, Mrs. Donaldson. But in this occasion, they had to go. They traveled through rivers and creeks um, to move to another station. 
hundred of hundreds of kilometres. And um, my grandmother said that her mother, Mabel Daly, used to catch fish and she would give, this is what my grandmother said, um, she would give us the flesh off the backbone. She gave us the best of what she had. So when I use that spine form, I'm really thinking about that strength and resilience of Aboriginal mothers, women, trying to hold culture and country and their you know, family together. Next one, thanks, David. Uh, this is just to show a little bit of the um, research that goes into public artworks for me. So this is a work that was made in 2004 uh, for the Brisbane Magistrates Court in, it's in the sort of the foyer spaces you go in and um, all the shells, I was looking at the archeological finds around the Moreton Bay area, because this is very close to um, the Brisbane River. Uh, in some parts of the river, it's known as Mewa and parts of Brisbane are known as Mianjin. And so you can see there's examples of various shells. And in fact, they've got their ID numbers or, um, you know, Queensland Museum sort of um, numbers written onto the shells. So I approached the head of conchology, um, John Stanisic, um, about what shells um, I'd found reference to and also which ones he thought I should look at. And he also suggested the Baylor shell, the big Baylor shell on the left and the razor clams because this, they, they would have been used. And then on a little, almost like a chocolate box, um, you know, when you find out what chocolates you've got and what's in them, on the side you can't see here, I've got, uh, you know, the scientific names, but above that I've got the indigenous names, Aboriginal names for these shells. And thinking about the two canoes, story of Brisbane was that, um, of course it was Aboriginal Brisbane at that stage. There you can see some of those, um, the numbering system written on the shells there. Uh, two convicts, uh, three con uh, castaway convicts actually, Finnegan, Parsons and Pamphlet, um, ended up traveling up uh, the Brisbane River. They'd been sort of looked after, after their boat had blown off course by Aboriginal people on some of the islands like Bribe Island, Stradbroke, Morton, etc. They ventured up the river and then they um, stole two canoes. I, I say stole. It, other people might say borrowed. I don't think they ever gave them back. So the, the sort of the forms in the middle are thinking about that and that cross colonization thing of what happens when you come into somebody else's space. And, um, and in fact, one of the convicts then went on to steal a canoe full of ships of uh, fish. So it was a interesting history of um, cultural contact and colonization. And then Oxley went with the convicts up and then sort of, you know, named uh, Canoe Creek, which now became Oxley Creek, etc. All right, we'll keep going. Preponderance of Aboriginal Blood. This is um, an artist book. And in fact, you, uh, I think it's Melbourne, I was trying to think, U University have got a copy of this book if you ever want to see the original one. But you can also... Uh, Purchase copies for your library if you're interested, because we've done a reprint of it. And it goes through and it shows some of the documentation uh, that is very much part of um, all Aboriginal people across Australia, but this pertains to Queensland and the electoral roll and who was eligible to vote. This particular letter on the left here is a woman who's asking the Department of Native Affairs uh, whether she is entitled to vote because she's already out from under the Act, the Aboriginal Protection and Assimilation, oh, sorry, Restriction of Opium Act. Um, you know, she's got a job, she and her husband, she's working, she's exempted. And then she gets this reply, which is very disparaging, saying, I don't really know what you mean, because you have a preponderance of Aboriginal blood, meaning Aboriginality through both sides of the family, you are not entitled to vote. So this was a documentation that travels all through this, um, this artist book. If you want to see any more of these, have a look at um, this title under uh, Graham Galleries Online and you'll see it's all been uploaded there. Uh, I should just say one thing back there too. Sorry, David, if we go back to the previous slide. The black, um, yep, so the next one. The black rectangles on the page, um, when I contacted uh, one of the descendants of this, this woman who had written this letter 
and uh, I gifted her a copy of um, the print that was made. This is um, etching uh, onto banana fibre paper and the photocopy of the, uh, the letters, etc. She was very upset when I sent it to her that the redactions were in there, those black crossed out bits. That had come from the Department of the State Archives. I actually think they look great because they sort of show the sort of level of bureaucracy which affected our people. And from an aesthetic point of view, I think they really add to this piece. But she really wanted to have the letter without this. So then I had to go back to the department and say, please, can I have the letter, copy of the letter without, and then send that back to her. She was very, very proud of her grandmother for bringing it up to the authorities and fighting to try and get, um, you know, the possibility of voting, which she was unable to do. Okay. Complicated Four, a number of these works um, and the next work as well relate to the death of both my grandmother in 2007, um, but also to uh, the death of Cameron Mulrunji uh, Dormaji, who um, died supposedly from a complicated fall in, uh, at the Watch House on Palm Island. And you probably know about that. Vernon Arkey, of course, has got his beautiful video work um, tall man. Um, there's many books and many, many, many um, media clips around this. At the time I was in the studio, I was listening to media coverage. I listened to a lot of radio, podcasts, etc. And uh, it was really, it was really horrible just listening to all of this stuff unfolding. And so I was um, with the raw pigment scrubbing it into the canvas itself. So that's the, you can see the um, the blue, um, yeah. Prussian blues and beneath it might be cobalts and sometimes ultramarines and I'm really pushing it into the canvas. So it gives it a very, very different look. And in this case, passing from the edge of memory to the night sky, imagining the ascendance of both my grandmother and um, Mulrunji Dumaji. Okay. This was a project that um, David actually mentioned, so I thought I'd put it in. Ochre and Blood, Mother of Pearl. I was asked to work on a Steinway piano, and I like the idea of having these Mother of Pearl shells around uh, the piano. This whole uh, launch of the Queensland Music Festival was in Winton, and I was thinking about the fact that Winton in central Queensland is all part of this um, an inland sea. The Mother of Pearl is sort of nestled into the sides, and you could see William there. Kev Carmody was another person and other musicians and, and my family members. I got to stamp onto pieces of paper and these were then laser etched into um, the piano itself, uh, the keys, and also into the, um, it's almost like the ears of the Mother of Pearl on the side. And Paul Grabowski first played this piano and then played it again later. And uh, I really wanted the idea of people playing the piano to collect the resonance of um, people like the amazing um, didgeridoo Yidiki player, uh, William Barton, and others feel that sensitivity between their fingers playing the piano and Aboriginal uh, people, Indigenous people from this place. And that's the bushing cloth, which anyone who knows pianos um, is inside the pianos holding the uh, instrumentation together. This one uh, is referencing, uh, it's called Salt in the Wound, and it's referencing a story that I was told at my grandmother's funeral in 2007 uh, from my family members, um, Shirley McNamara, who you might know is an amazing woman, runs her own cattle station, uh, and is also an incredible weaver of spin effects, which she embeds with ochre and feathers, among other things, and her mother, um, Ruby Saltmere. So, uh, they told me the story about how my great-great-grandmother, who is also um, part of their family, uh, their relation um, through like a cousin-cousin relationship, escaped a massacre at Lawn Hill uh, Station. And that was, we were trying to work it out, must have been sort of 1800 and say 50 on, something like that. She and another young girl were hiding behind a windbreak. So you can see the form on the left here. And uh, the troopers came in. They were massacring people all across 
Queensland and many parts of Australia, as you're probably aware at that stage. She and the young girl rolled under the windbreak, which in those days were very flimsy, uh, you know, sort of branches and things like that put together. Um, and she was stabbed through the upper part of the body, her um, upper arm, I think, uh, with a bayonet, and she carried that scar for the rest of the life, of her life, according to um, Shirley and um, Ruby, who knew her. Um, and they managed to get down to the water. They managed to put some, the, the two young girls, while everybody else was being killed, they put some rocks on their bellies to hold them under and breathed through straws in order to stay alive. So once again, I think of the fragility of the windbreak, the fragility of the reeds, the straws, in order to stay, sustain your life. This one, salt in the wood, uh, part of this is the ears. And uh, this was um, Yuani and Scarce and I actually cast people's ears at um, a workshop in South Australian School of Art for part of this exhibition. And this is where uh, Jack Watson, who's no relation to us, apparently had all of these ears, uh, Blackfellas ears nailed to the slab um, wall huts of his homestead, according to Carolyn Cray, uh, who was a young woman riding through in those days. And you can read that in her uh, diary where she says, this, uh, the blacks were not the only savages in those days. For at Lawn Hill, um, I saw not less than 40 pairs of blackfellas ears nailed to the slab hut homestead in retaliation for the spearing of cattle. Okay, next. Um, David had mentioned to me about uh, the way that I've been using graphs, and this was probably some of the earliest times I was using graphs was when I did a residency at Heron Island. And uh, this is part of a, a suite of etchings, Heron Island suite. You can see this particular, um, that graph came from Professor Ovehab Gul, um, Gulberg. There was Dr. Bradley Congdon. Yeah, that's mass coral bleaching. The next one, is um, the scratchy bit is the sea surface temperature rising and up the top is the, the black noddies feeding frequency and meal size. Um, that also relates to um, the, the shearwater mutton birds that fly in. And we've been seeing that, you know, their survival is um, more and more depleted over the years too, which relates to many things. Climate change has a lot to do with it. Uh, but also overfishing of waters um, means that the adult birds have to fly further and further in order to find um, feed for their young. They have to dive deeper. And by the time they got back to their nests in Heron Island in 2002, a lot of the chicks had died in the nest. Okay. Uh, Bunya um, and Proclamation, I'll talk about this one and then the next one, have got the images of the Bunya leaves which you can see coming down almost like spines and they are talking about the proclamation by Governor Gibbs when um, Queensland was under New South Wales um, territory before it seceded. <laughs> uh, Governor Gibbs recognised the importance of the bunya pine and the, the bunya seeds you can see at the top here on the left to uh, local Aboriginal people. So like uh, the Bogon moths, you know, further south uh, in Australia, during the um, feasting times of the Bunya, people would come from all over. They'd come from south, west, east, um, north to gather and have huge ceremonies. I guess it's like a big, you know, sort of um, sports carnival or the Olympics or whatever now because there's been lots of cultural exchange happening. And um, a few years after Governor Gibbs made that proclamation, um, that all sort of fell away and uh, a lot of returned soldiers, et cetera, were given the land where the bunya uh, trees were. Okay, next. This was made down at uh, Tarawara in an earlier exhibition, The Scarifier, talking about the history of Corandirk Station. And you can see the photographic images at the back of um, William Barrack and other Aboriginal workers on the station with the hops. Uh, which were very, very successfully grown on this station. And Aboriginal people who were moved from all across Victoria to this station, um, the same as um, they were removed from all across Australia. Um, 
if people, if uh, the colonists wanted particular resources when, well, the blackfellas, you know, the Aboriginal mob were moved, moved on. At the back there, you can see the poles used for electric fencing, um, the branches, you know, used to indicate how the hops were grown, and then the, um, the beautiful uh, calico shirts and skirts and things like that, which actually a friend of mine who's a beautiful costume designer, Edie Kurzer, made for me. Thinking about the way that um, Aboriginal people died in these situations many times from influenza, uh, wet clothing, you know, really bad, um, hot, you know, house conditions, home conditions. Uh, and around here, you can see all of these um, canvases on the wall are from significant mountains around um, Corrindirk and uh, Tarawara. And they include, you know, ones that are close by and also Mount Borbore, which is further away. And in the back, you can see that cross, which is a 141 uh, page document uh, in which William Barak and others were objecting to being moved out yet again from Corrindirk Station to Parliament. Uh, the documentation was between Parliament and William Barak and others. Uh, the names of places, uh, you can see this, you might have seen this in the experimental show or others going on, and it's what I call a roll of discredits. Usually get the roll of credits after a movie. Well, this one has the discredits. This is what was collected back in 2016 by myself and others of a list of um, places where massacres occurred across Australia. Of course, there's many, many more, and we also have an interactive um, Matt website, which I'm not sure if it's still working at the moment, uh, which people can go on to click on a site and uh, learn more about what occurred at that place, as well as see some of the original documentation. So the people who worked with me uh, and are working with me on this project is Greg Hooper, uh, Jonathan Richards and Greg Hooper's son, Angus Hooper. And this was another collection, research collection, looking at, um, and I'd suggest everyone have a look at this document. It's um, Tony Roberts, The Brutal Truth, or uh, which is in the monthly. You can just Google and find that online. And also his book, Frontier Justice. So I was looking especially at uh, per, the, both the perpetrators and those who enabled uh, the perpetration to occur or actively um, organised it. So those ones are in black, like, um, who can I read here? Um, Judge William uh, Bundy, for example. I know that um, there's many names that you would know if you actually have a look. And then the, the ones written in red are actually the perpetrators. Right. So for example, Alexander Downer's grandfather, I think is in there. This is um, a project, if you've ever been to Goma recently, quite Goma in Brisbane, um, this was towards the making. You can actually look online and see it uh, being made by Urban Art Projects and others. And that's Lisa Carmichael, known as Elisa Jane Carmichael on the left and myself, looking at tow row nets in the Queensland Museum. And tow row nets um, are called tow row nets uh, down in southeast Queensland, but these sort of butterfly nets um, occur and were made in various places around Australia. I first saw one when I was living in Darwin and um, working with um, some of the women at Man and Greeda and uh, Susan Marawa uh, from that community was showing me how they are used in one of the water holes there. All right, next, thank you. And so this is how it has been transformed for outside um, Goma. And uh, you can see the river behind there and here's some dancers um, uh, new knuckle dances from uh, Stradbroke, from Injeriba. These uh, works resistance pins are evoked by many things. I've always been interested in awls, um, sewing tools, you know, sort of utilitarian objects, both from Australia and from around the world. And in the right of the, the left uh, image, you can see some tools, bronze tools, which actually have got a an interesting little sort of um, shape at the top of them. They were used specifically to prise apart pandanus seeds. 
So each tool had a particular purpose or it might be multi-purposed. And I was also thinking about the story about Emma Miller, who was, I see as a resistance fighter in Brisbane. She led a group of um, seams, the Seamstress um, Union back in 1912. And she was um, on Black Friday, you know, reading, uh, leading them to try and march for better wages for the group. And uh, Paddy Carhill, who was the, you know, police constable at the time, rode up on his horse. Emma Miller, who was a little old lady, very Edwardian, big hat, took her hat pin out and uh, actually stuck it into the horse as Paddy was riding towards her, trying to disperse the mob. And uh, supposedly the rider was unseated and had a limp for the rest of his life. And once again, this little fragile old lady took this little tiny elegant hat pin out and um, saved the day. So once again, I'm very attracted to that. Okay, next. The witness tree, uh, you can hear inside trees using these listening devices that were set up by Greg Hooper, uh, the sound of the tree pulling water up from the roots and up to the leaves uh, during photosynthesis. And on this day, we were at the site overlooking the Mile Creek Massacre and I was really drawn to these trees. So this was part of the sound piece for it. And there's a video uh, which goes with it. And there's an exhibition called Mile Creek Massacre and Beyond, which is traveling around where you could possibly see this. The bandaging is a bit like bandaging a wound. Next, thank you. Uh, this has just been launched. It's called Jugama. We can look at the next one too, please, at uh, the University of Sydney. And I was looking at a beautiful bag that was um, taken uh, from Sydney or Port Jackson, as it was known then in about 1780 something, uh, over to the British Museum. It was made out of um, the bark from the Illawarra flame tree, which apparently is quite unusual. Usually, usually it's another sort of um, one of those trees that would have been used. And here we have um, Les McLeod, um, doing the smoking ceremony for it. And the material is um, steel. Okay. These ones here, I probably need to run through them a little bit, but um, these ones are related to COVID graphs and they were made um, early last year during COVID times. Some of them have been sewn. Uh, you can see in this case by my cousin, Dorothy Watson. And I was thinking about how we were sustaining ourselves and also the COVID graphs, which I see as a bit of a, a scar on our psyche. So they, the graph source I was getting off the internet or off the news sites and then thinking about where I was spending my time, which was a lot of the time in the garden or in the studio. And there's a lot of exhausted indigo at the back there, which is probably how we all felt. Okay, more. And you can also see this, it's sort of like a welt wound uh, sewn in the back there and when I'm thinking of the stitching I'm thinking about the idea of the needle going into pierce and then coming back to repair so it's like pier pierce repair pierce repair sewing and repairing but at, at the same time making a wound like form okay we'll move on and these ones these two works here have just been made recently for an exhibition at the IMA uh, the exhibition is called on fire curated by Tim Walsh, who's currently uh, in Melbourne. So please say hello to him when you see him. He's going to be doing some work at um, uh, Gertrude um, space. So these relate to um, fire, um, you know, sort of danger ratings all across our states and they all have different categories, but really it's the same. And then the previous one is the temperature uh, rising and then we'll move on. Just a few more, I think. And these ones are going to be part of what's going to be in the National. So look for them if you come down to see the National in Sydney. So I'm looking at um, the whole installation is called Clouds and Undercurrents. And so these are various graphs that have been hand sewn uh, with indigo behind. And there's a whole lot of other things which will be in there, as well as one new language and a sound piece, which you will hear as you go down the escalators. And you'll hear the sound of both Bujmala our country in Northwest Queensland, and also the sound of 
if you were to go down, which we did, to under the tank stream underground in Sydney and the sound of what it's like being under there. And this very last two uh, is part of a public art project which should be launched later this year. It's been a five year project or more, and it's talking about the borough. So this uh, woman here in Sydney on her Nawi, her canoe is fishing and on the end of her line, which would have been spun, the line would have been spun probably from um, some sort of uh, fibre. Uh, and then if we keep going, the very last one is, or second last one, these are some of the bara or the fish hooks found in this area, particular area in Sydney. Beautiful mother of pearl forms. And then this will be hopefully what you will see um, up in the Botanic Gardens, looking down on the Opera House and looking at um, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And at the moment, we're looking at lighting. So Utsun said that when he was talking about the Opera House, he would like it to look as if it's lit by the light of the moon. And I love that idea. So we're trying to see whether we can get the phases of the moon embedded in the lighting system for Barra. And I think that's all. Thank you. Are you there? Hello. I am here. <laughs> I am here. Hold on a moment. I've just, Ash, can you turn my video on, please? There we go. So Judy, thank you so much for such a beautiful overview of, um, uh, of these aspects of your career. We've got some time for a few questions and um, a few have come into, uh, into the Q&A. So if anyone has a question, please post it in the Q&A facility. Um, the first one is, uh, Judy, can you please tell us about your thinking around the installation of your canvases with push pins in looking glass? Is this a gestural or a symbolic decision or is it something else? That's a really good question. So I've never liked the look of, um, for me, of uh, canvases stretched. Uh, I trained as a printmaker and I also do a lot of work with handmade paper. And I love the torn sort of looking edge or the, you know, the deckled edge of the paper. And I think that if anyone remembers old school ways of doing posters where you, you would put something through a photocopier uh, to make a poster and you'd stick bits together and then put it through. If um, you had something cut out on the photocopier, you'd see the line of that extra piece of paper on the photocopier. If you tear the paper and photocopy it, you don't see it. So in a way, to me, the torn edge of the canvas is like that. It's like I don't see that hard edge and it's almost like um, you, your vision is not blinkered by the hard edge, but it, then it goes out. I love the floating form. Um, I've had lunch on many of my canvases and carry them under my arm and it's a great way to send them to. Uh, so I really like being able to sort of transfer them. I throw them over my back and probably treat them um, in a way that, you know, conservation people and others wouldn't like to know, but they do get a lot of um, thrashing. I dance on them, I put embed them with um, all sorts of materials, and that's why I, I do that. And the pins are a really quick, easy way of putting them on the wall. However, I have learnt to put some sailcloth uh, with archival um, adherent behind, and I work with the conservator. Um, Anne Carter from the Queensland Art Gallery to do that. So I'm aware that I don't want the, um, the canvases to be pulled down and to tear the material. So being trained as a printmaker, I think I do think about things like that. Great. Um, this question is, what advice would you give to other First Nations artists wanting to learn more about their Indigenous heritage where there is a lack of familial knowledge? Well, there's always a lack of knowledge and there certainly was for me uh, when I started out. So basically, you've just got to do your homework. You've got to, and that includes talking to your community and your elders, um, going to libraries, museums, wherever you can to find out material. Uh, you know, it might be social media, might be friends, colleagues, but you've got to reach out and educate yourself in order to make the work. That's what I think anyway. Mm. Um, thank you for this presentation. Is okay, there can I say one more thing on that? No, I haven't finished yet. Keep going. 
Okay, I was just going to say one more thing is also try and get back to your country. You will learn a lot from that. Um, the first time I sort of, I'd been to my country, but when I went back with family, I took the documentation with me and we sat down on country and then we went through it. And that was so important and interesting and I learned so much and they did too. Um, this question says, uh, thank you for this presentation. Is there a conduit for your research to find its way to the recently announced Truth Commission in Victoria? What is that? <laughs> What's the truth? I don't know very much about it, but the Victorian government has certainly flagged the idea of uh, a Truth Commission whereby um, I guess we would we we might call it the atrocities of colonization were actually more fully explored and and made more visible and sure. I guess this question's asking is there a relationship between truth telling uh, in Victoria and the possibility of your work given that you're from Queensland well, I think every time, I mean, I'm living on another country at the moment. I'm not living on one new country and, um, you know, making work down at, um, you know, Tarawara. Um, it's always working with other people and other community. And even for uh, when I made the work at Bunjalaka, that involved working with um, people on, on country, going out to a lot of cultural keeping places. This is the etched zinc wall outside. Uh, Bunjalaka galleries called Warwicka. So I think that um, it's always a matter of trying to pay respect and, and working with people in communities. And in terms of my work coming down uh, as part of that, I don't know, it's really up to the people who are involved in the truth telling if they want to have access to, for example, um, the book that was done, Preponderance of Aboriginal Blood, which talked about the, the system in Queensland and how uh, Aboriginal people were kept away from voting rights. I mean, that's all possible. Um, yeah, it really just depends on people reaching out. Mm -hmm. um, this one says, thank you, Judy, an incredible talk. I was wondering if you could talk about your relationship with water. Uh, yes. Water has always been a conduit for me and it's been really really important and in fact David you mentioned the other day one of the first works that you saw I think was called when was that from 91 or 92? I think 91 I think. yeah 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 and it's um just a long rectangle of um canvas with put pigment pushed into it called dropping into water slowly so I always however I get into water or whether I'm washing my hands doing the the dishes you know under the shower in the bath swimming, walking in water, and I use a lot of it in my um, studio practice, it is a conduit for me. It's way I think more clearly. And it's almost like, um, you know, when you sort of go down, uh, put your head down in the bath and suddenly you're between two worlds. You might have part of your ear above listening to sounds there. And then as you grow down, it's a subterranean sound. So I've always, always been part of that. And one year people are known as running water people. So I think it's uh, in our water or our, our water is uh, and blood are, you know, sort of intermingled really. Mm -hmm. We're just coming to the last question. And um, actually there are a whole stack of questions about public art and about all sorts of things. But I'll just finish with this last one where um, the person who's asked the question says, I'm curious about the technical aspects of your Brisbane Magistrates course piece. There must have been a lot of translating your usual media, you know, uh, natural analog hand applied into something mm. else, because the final effect looks great in the photo. How did you achieve that? What is it made of? And what were the processes? Sure. Uh, yes, good question. I was asked to work in glass. I've never worked in glass before. And so it's always something of not thinking, how can I do it? But how can I work with the best people to achieve it? So, for example, with any public art, I always say that when I went to art school and did sculpture, my welding was pretty bad. So I always work with somebody who's good at welding or, you know, the bronze casting or whatever. And in this case, it was between Urban Art Projects, who I've worked with first in 1994 for my very first public art project, when they were very young uh, men, you know, starting out. And now they're, you know, sort of um, top of their game, I think, in terms of their business practice. 
and also other people. So in this case, it was finding um, the glass people. Uh, I employed um, Richard Stringer, a photographer, who did an amazing job uh, photographing the shells. And also John Stanisic from the Queensland Museum had a lot of faith in me to actually give me as an art artist coming in these boxes of shells to take away, which I th thought, whoa, <laughs> that's very trusting. But, you know, sort of everything was handled very respectfully. And uh, really, I just talked to experts within all of that stuff. And um, I don't like doing all the project management myself. So I will pass that on to other people. Mm. Good question. And there's, oh, you don't know, but there's also fiber optic lighting behind there. So you do see lights uh, coming from behind when they're working, technology, and also lights onto the work. Judy, we're going to leave it there. I just, I really, on behalf of everybody who's attended, just a big, big thank you for your generosity today and um, just taking through, uh, taking us through such a, an incredible career. And, um, you know, the thing I love about your work is there's, it's just like you're constantly learning, constantly finding new ways of expressing what matters to you. And that's uh, it's very, very inspiring for us. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing your work in the image is not nothing curated by Lisa Radford and Yuani Scarce, which opens at the Margaret Lawrence Gallery in May this year. So on behalf of everybody, thank you so much, Judy. We, we so appreciate you joining us today. And Thank to you. Love, love, lovely to speak to all of you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. And to everyone else, we will see you at 12.30 next Thursday for Art Forum Session 2 for Semester 1 2021. Thank you again, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.